There's this one thing in life you never seem to have enough of. And the more you get, it seems you need it even more. You guessed it, money. Making more money is usually one of our biggest lifelong goals. And we like to think that having more of it increases happiness. The truth is, that's not always the case. This week's book claims that how you spend your money is the most important. Not how much you have. Following a few key principles can give you the biggest happiness bang for your buck. Like buying experiences. Indulging less often. Paying now, but consuming later. And investing in others. Let's dig deeper here in Elizabeth Dunn's book, Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending. Welcome back. You're listening to Motivation Minute, where we unravel the timeless truths in that stack of books you've been wanting to read so that you don't have to. And this week's book is called Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending. And on this episode, we're bringing on the guy who told me about Happy Money, who is Graham Ewing. So welcome to the show, Graham. Thanks for having me. You told me about Happy Money, I think last year. And so I read the book. I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. So, you know, spending money for most people is like a, a challenging thing. Like it can cause headaches, can't it? And the thing about happy money is it changes the way you spend your money. It really does. It really does. And you know, as a financial planner, we often focus on things like saving money and growing money through investments. But we don't always spend a lot of time on how clients should spend money. And if you think about it, that, that's actually just as complicated and just as ridiculously difficult as figuring out how to save the right amount of money and figuring out the right way to invest your money as well. Yeah, I was just talking to my business partner about spending money and you know we try not to get into each other's personal lives too much, but I was, we were saying things like, what if we'd spent less money on eating out you know, or, or on you know, our personal lives here and there? Because it's like one of, you know, it's regardless of how much money we're making, it seems we're always spending it all or we're not being smart about how we spend it. And then it's like, well, maybe we could just make more money, but, but that's not really the answer either. It's like, what are you going to do with it once you have it? Precisely. Yeah, the book said there was this um, study done where people that were making more than $75,000 a year, like if you raised their income incrementally above that, there was no significant increase in day-to-day happiness. Isn't that surprising? You would think that Seventy-five versus one hundred fifty thousand would be a dramatic difference in how happy you are. This book said there was like negligible difference. You could be happy with less. Yeah, and it it, it really you know answers the question: Can money buy happiness? And in that study, it shows it can it can to a certain point, but you know beyond yeah. seventy-five thousand, it's it's marginal. So is that maybe because like? Um, it's like I've heard of like the hierarchy of needs or something that could, where it's like, yeah, you, you want to start with, um, you know, your essentials, your food, shelter and everything like that. And, and that, and you need to ha- be able to do that. But then once you get above 75,000, it's like, that's when you start, like people start buying luxuries maybe, or things they don't need. And so when you start buying those types of things, they don't really intri- increase our happiness, like material things. But it, it was saying something in the book about rather than buying you know, like more things, like what if you could buy or like per, somehow buy experiences? Yes, that was such a good point the book made because like so uh, they were talking about how like with experiences you can anticipate experiences and like you get entertaining stories after you have an experience, but and they add texture to your life. But a physical thing just gives you like this temporary rush of pleasure that disappears. An experience is really different. Absolutely. Well, think of think of uh, any time you've gone on vacation. If you've you know purchased a flight, and um, yeah, you know that's not coming up for a few months, but you have that anticipation for the flight um, or for the vacation overall, and then you know beyond the, the the anticipation, you have the vacation itself. But a huge benefit that often gets discounted is the time afterwards when you're looking back on the trip and you're thinking of all the memories that you, um, that you gained from that trip and, 
and one of the keys in the book when it talks about buying experiences is they can be amplified that that principle can be amplified if you are um, if you're doing those experiences or having those experiences with other people and there's that social connection that's Ooh, huge interesting so the connection okay that's good i and that so you got connection that increases an in experience the book also talked about you could make a physical thing become an experience by being intentional about how and when you use it and i thought that was really true too like um in my house uh we always have around the holidays um we bring out this toy called Rockenbach that's this giant construction set with all these interconnecting pieces and it takes days to build and you know hours to take down when the time comes whenever whenever i see Rockenbach out i know it's a holiday <laughs> because it's how we use it we never use it when it's not a holiday hmm. so it, it becomes an experience not a thing so because you only use it on certain occasions it's really special yeah it's like uh, having a game night like i don't play card games or board games very often but when i do it's with friends and it's the, that social connection and there's something about it that just like makes it so special you know it's so fun but if i if i'm doing it by myself or something it's not really very important and like you said yeah. you only do it on holidays so it talked about things that are people will pay more for things that are only uh, available certain times of the year like eggnog or certain flavors of ice cream people will pay more for those things than they would than they do if they could buy it buy them at any time even though they're the same thing it's like <laughs> if it's a lot more special when we don't indulge as often in things well and that takes us right to the the second principle the, the first was buy experiences the second one right? is make it a treat and you, yep. you know your examples have clearly shown that it's the concept of not overindulging in something or or even an experience you know not overindulging in an experience because you know humans have an incredible ability to adapt so if you play that that board game um or if you you know spence you didn't do that just around the holidays it's a completely right. different you know different reaction you have when you're not making it a treat mm. i also think about like how we consume music like today with music isn't much of a treat these days because we've got Spotify and we have Apple Music. You can have like a buffet of music whenever you want it. Sure. And I've made an intentional choice counter to the culture to not subscribe to any of those services. And I always buy albums, which seems so old to do now. Sure. The funny thing about music for me is I, if I buy the album, then I can enjoy the music for what it's worth in that album and not be thinking about the next album that I haven't listened to yet. Right. Very true. You know, having easier access to things just makes you take them for granted more, you know? And so you don't, it's yeah. not special anymore. And, you know, it talked about what if we could actually um, apply this to our, to our life and to everything, this idea of, of scarcity. Like if we look at our, if we could look at our own life as scarce because we could, you know, we don't live that, you know, life is short. We could die any time. What if we were more conscious of that, of how short life really is, and and appreciated it more, and and thought of lots of things in that way? Exactly. The third principle of this book is is exactly that. It's buying time. There's only one resource right. that's more finite than than money, and that's time. Hmm. And we often, you know, focus, especially in you know the the U.S. society, we're focusing on how do we make more money? How do we make more money? How do we make more mm -hmm. money? But we're not always looking at, well, what can we do to, to better spend our time? Hmm. Yeah. I'm curious as a financial planner, like, I, I don't know what type of advice you give people, but like, um, I just know that a lot of people have this idea of, you know, well, I'm going to save some money here. So I'm going to do my own taxes or I'm going to, you know, fix my car myself, even though I barely know how or, you know, try to like save money, but end up spending all this time doing these things that you don't like to do, you know, or that, that you could, what if you could, you know, invest that time into your job a little bit more so you'd make more money. That way you could pay somebody to do these things for you or just there's be more better ways to do things, right? Absolutely. And, and I think it's, as in all things, there's a balance. There's things right. that you can choose to uh, pay 
someone to do and therefore you're, you're buying time. Um, and then there's other things like you said, where if you, you know, you're preparing your own taxes, there's, you know, while, while that might not be advisable for other reasons, you know, there's, you can learn, you know, some good things by preparing your own mm-hmm. taxes. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it's about that balance and finding out what is it that you really, really don't like to do and, you know, pay to free up that time. It doesn't mean, yeah. that doesn't mean pay for everything so that you can just sit on the couch and watch TV, you know, every single mm-hmm. night. It's, it's because finding that won't balance. bring you happiness. No, mm-hmm. no. And, and like you said, dry in the book, they, there's three things that they talk about with buying time. And uh, one of the things is your commute. How, how should you use money to kind of adjust your commute to work? The other one okay. is how, how much time should you be spending watching TV? And then the other, time, the other one is how much time can you spend with friends and family? Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard balance. It's like the one, yeah, the, the principle that I kind of like the most in the book is the, um, the pay now and consume later. And it's like a principle, I think, of, you know, it's better to do something hard now and then and have fun later kind of. So for me, it's like I want to work, you know, I don't always accomplish this, but I want to work a lot now while I'm young and invest in the right things now. And then so that there's going to be the reward later. And rather than have fun now while I'm young and then have to pay for all that when I get older. But that's just kind of how I see it. It's um the book brought up the dreaded taxi meter that keeps ticking mm. and how it's that feeling in your head that you know you you've got this pressure to you know pay up and and that's not making you happy when you have this pressure going on and the concept is like make things feel free right now by paying before now. Yeah. I love pre-ordering things. I did this um around Christmas I pre-ordered a book um, the digital minimalism book we covered recently. And what was great about that was I got to anticipate it. I'm thinking about it for weeks mm-hmm. before it comes. And I'm just all excited. I'm reading up on articles about it online and listening to podcasts and looking at the special resources that were available for pre-orders only. And it was just fun. It felt like you were in a club. And then the book came and it's like, that was the gravy yeah. over the whole thing. Like yeah. it, the book could have never come and the excitement was more fun <laughs> than the book almost. Yeah. Well, in that episode that you you guys did, um, you brought up the example of, uh, I I think it was going to Blockbuster. And you talked about the anticipation, you know, as you're driving the Blockbuster and, you know, before you get there, there's there's this anticipation of what movie Uh am I going to get? And the, the principle of buy now and enjoy later, you know, a lot of it has to do with what you're talking about, that anticipation that just builds and builds and builds before you actually even go through the experience. And you mentioned earlier about a plane ticket, Graham. And I like, and I've just thought of that just now. Like, a lot of times it's happened where I, uh, I didn't get the plane ticket soon enough, or I waited till the last minute, and then it was way too expensive, <laughs> or just, and it, you know. But instead of waiting, you know, if you if you get it a month or a couple months ahead of time, then it's cheaper and it's also. Um, you know, it's smarter because then once it feels like it's free, once the time actually comes, <laughs> you're like, "Hey, I might as well go." <laughs> might as well go. Got this tick laying around. And, yeah. <laughs> See, I think you could do this like even beyond just spending. Like I do this with saving. Um, the pay now, consume later. So it's more like save now, buy later. Is yeah. how I save. Yeah. And um, I I got this idea from someone that was um naming your money, which was interesting. Uh. Because when you do that, when you say this set of money is for the mountain bike, which is a savings account I set up just for my mountain bike that I'm going to get this spring, uh, you buy it more guilt-free because you named that money to go to the mountain bike. Or I have an account for my Roth IRA or my auto insurance or an emergency fund. Like I've got all these savings accounts with different names that the money is guilt-free in there for a specific cause. And it makes it so that I'm happy when I spend it. It makes a difference, actually, when it's saved that way. Hmm. Well, first, I have to I have to say kudos on the bucket for the Roth IRA as a financial yeah. advisor. <laughs> I, I got a clap for that. Um, 
but yeah, there's, there's, there's the whole side of financial planning that is completely behavioral. Um, and the idea of naming your money and, you know, giving nicknames to your savings accounts, I believe is called mental accounting. And uh-huh. it's, you're in your mind, you've earmarked that money for a specific uh, call. So you attach an emotion to that, which is so much more powerful than logic. You know, we can, we can, use, yes. you know, try to use our, our logic and be rational, but we're not rational hmm. beings. So when you do that, then by naming, uh, naming your money, you know, it's such a powerful concept. Yeah. There's one other principle that was really good in this book, which is about giving. What was interesting is the book said you buy more happiness by spending less yourself and that the amount you give away and how you give it has more impact on your happiness than, you know, what you actually spend. They did a study for the university that, uh, that Elizabeth Dunn is a professor at. I think it's University of British Columbia um, out of okay. Vancouver. And they, it, they called it, I think, the envelope experiment. And they had $5 in each envelope. And there was a little instruction in each of the envelopes. One of the envelopes said, take this $5 and go spend it on yourself. And the other envelope said, take this $5 and go, you know, buy something for somebody else. Go spend it on someone else. Huh. And they, uh, they rated these, these people before and asked, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your happiness? And then they rated after they went through the experiment and they found that the people that spent the $5 on other people were happier than the people that spent the money on themselves. Ah, uh, this is interesting. So think about it. So when you spend on someone else, you're buying them a physical thing, but it's an experience for you. So you get both the experience and the thing out of giving it to them. Yeah. Versus just getting the thing for yourself hmm. in a sense because you're thinking about how do I present it in the best way to them? You know, what do they really want? Like you have to go deep into their psychology kind of to figure out, you know, what's going to give them the biggest happiness, which is in turn giving you bigger happiness. It is. And and one of the the concepts they, they added to this was that if you can do it in a way that makes a connection, it amplifies it even more. Again, talking about the the relationships and the connections and the example or the story they gave, there's this British couple that I think had just gotten engaged and they bought a lotto ticket. And they won $163 million. (laughs) And they, what they decided to do, I don't know if many people would do this, but they decided, um, they wrote up a list of of their 15 to 20 closest friends and family that had made a real impact on their lives. And they gave each of those people a million dollars, making them, you know, a millionaire just out of the blue. Instantly. And they, you know... Obviously, that makes a connection when you give somebody just a million dollars. That would. But it's, yeah, it was an incredible story. Yeah, it's so rewarding to see when someone is actually in need and they actually need something or, you know, to, to help them out. It, uh, it's really it's really rewarding. And and uh, I think, you know, it's it's what we're supposed to do or it's the, it's the right thing to do, you know, um, to, to give to the poor and to the needy. You know, it's rather, and we... We know that, but but secretly and in, in deep down, we're like, ah, but that I don't want to do that. You know, I, I want to like I could think of all the stuff I could buy, or I I need this money for myself. But if you could realize, wow, it's actually going to make me happier, and I'm going to be a you know happier, and if I give it to somebody else, <laughs> it's interesting. And what's interesting is like you can track uh, how you're giving to people, but you can also track the ways you're indirectly giving to people, or Uh, the time you're investing. Like I know, Graham, I think you do like value-based spending or cash flow tracking. Isn't that right? You have like core values. Yeah. You track things under. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how that works with like the giving concept and how that changes your happiness with spending? Yeah. So, you know, one way that you can put a a budget together is by saying, okay, here's groceries, here's a mortgage, here's, you know, um, eating out, here's entertainment. But the way that I've uh, designed my tracking of cash flow is is by value. So I'm looking at okay, how much am I am I giving? Because that's that's a value of mine. 
And then another one is how much am I, you know, spending time with my wife? You know, are we going out on a date night? Are we, are we doing things yeah. together? And any, any expense that's kind of associated with that, like a date night goes into that category. And then family and friends, you know, t- times where we go out and have a meal together. Um, it, it doesn't need to just reflect the expense of the restaurant. It should reflect, okay, that, that was an experience with my family um, for the relationship for the relationship. And it, it actually goes back uh, dry what you said um, earlier. So Maslow's hierarchy of, of yeah, needs, that's what it is. There's the, the pyramid and every single one of your expenses, um, how logical or illogical you might think they are. Every single one of those is attached to, a need. It doesn't have to be a physical need like food or a roof over your head. Uh-huh. It could be a social need or uh. something else that, that is attached to that. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't a, uh, a necessary expense, so you should just cut it out of your budget. You have to see what is that expense actually attached to? What, what value is that attached to for you? Wow. That is interesting. That's really good. I would be very interested to learn more about that or how you how that's set up. That's really cool. Like, so he showed me like his spreadsheet at one point where he has like the category and then he puts the value next to it basically and then sorts it all that way. And I did this last year for my cash flow. I decided to do the same thing. It made a huge difference because you're looking at things you paid for like, hey, you might have gotten a tank of gas, but you're like, I got that tank of gas so that I could go do this thing with a friend. Mm. That was a relationship expense, not a gas expense. Uh. Yep. And it changes the way you think about how you spent your money wow. so that like it's tempting it, when you do this to be like, well, overspending on the relationship and buying things you don't need to. But as long as you balance it out with like a reasonable amount on the thing versus the value you have, it's a great way to kind of legitimize expenses in your head and make it more fun because you have a purpose to spending. Huh. And that's the key is, is spending deliberately that, you know, 99% yeah. of, of society spends in a very reactive way um, and in a yeah. non-deliberate way. But the key is how do we use our money to enhance, you know, relationships? How do we use our money to enhance our values? How do we use our money in a deliberate way? And that's, you know, that's the key. Right. Well, this has been a really fun discussion on happy money. And I love this concept of getting the biggest bang for your buck in happiness per dollar spent. I think that's my number one takeaway, that it's more like where, how, and why you spend money that matters than the amount you're actually spending. So thanks for coming on, Graham, to talk with us about this. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you? Well, I work at the the financial consulate. I think that's really my only online presence. Uh, I have not read digital minimalism, but I, I'm trying to kick social media for a while. Um, <laughs> but the financial consulate, and I guess I still do have LinkedIn, but those are the only two. Nice. If you want to hear a book like this every week, just tap subscribe because this is where it happens and you don't want to miss any action. You know, we have a book like Happy Money every week, but not guests as awesome as Graham every week. So <laughs> this was a pleasure to have you on. Remember to check out our survey motivationminute.com tap survey and we want to hear the books that you want to hear to come on the show and we actually got some responses recently that hopefully we'll be featuring those books soon so thanks for sending those in and thanks for listening we'll see you next week